climate change, deforestation, waste food, overfishing, poverty, and malnutrition. Finding a solution to those problems is why I'm here today. And as founder of End Tomorrow, my team and I research how insects can be the answer. So usually when I tell people that, everyone always asks me the same question. Roshan, why would a smart, good-looking guy like you <laughs> want to research insects? And it's a fair question. I mean, my background is that of a geneticist. I'm usually in a lab like that, using my knowledge of genomics to research diseases like cancer. I'm also a programmer, and as a programmer, the only bugs I deal with are the software kind. <laughs> and as someone who's grown up here in BC and really seen the incredible beauty this province has to offer, insects are incredibly annoying. <laughs> Seriously, not even 30 seconds after that last photo was taken, I was stung by a bee. So why insects? I'd like to tell you the story of a woman who didn't just change my perspective on what insects were capable of, but whose story inspired me to start using them to make a difference in my world. A couple years ago, I read an article about a farmer named Jai. And Jai had a problem that I think uh, many of the parents here can probably relate to. You see, her daughter loved eating crickets. <laughs> That's weird, right? <laughs> I don't think it's just like a millennial thing either. It's, it's weird. But in Thailand, where Jai and her family live and, and work, insects are normal. In fact, if you go to marketplaces in Thailand, you'll see Insects like scorpions and crickets and larvae being sold as food. So to make her daughter happy, Jai ordered some cricket eggs in the mail, and without having any previous experience, she built a small cricket farm. And after three months of trial and error, her daughter had all the crickets she could possibly want for the next year. <laughs> but something really interesting happened. You see, Jai's neighbors started to buy crickets from her. And she was able to use the profits to build another cricket farm. And then more people started to buy crickets from her. So she used those profits to build another farm, and then another, and then another. And soon, soon she had turned a $90 investment to build her first farm into a business that provided her family with $600 of profit every month. By farming crickets instead of livestock, Jai was able to pay off her farm. She was able to buy a car. But most importantly, she was able to pull her family out of poverty and improve the quality of their lives. You see, in third world countries, life is tough. And this is especially the case for women. They tend to have greater household responsibilities thrust upon them from a much younger age. And this limits their ability to gain skills and an education that will help them to succeed later in life. But because insect farming has such a low barrier to entry, this means that women like Jai can commercialize them and use the profits to not only take care of their families, but take care of themselves. And because insects as a source of food are so nutritious, they are an extremely powerful way to counter not just poverty, but malnutrition. Insect farming, both as a source of food and as a source of commercialization, offers a way to pull 100 to 150 million people out of hunger and malnutrition, while serving as a very realistic solution to addressing poverty and the gender gap. How incredible is that? Yeah. Damn right. Now, I think it's fair to say that, having heard this story, everyone here is ready to 
start eating insects right now, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but outside of this auditorium, it's probably safe to say it's, it's going to be a little bit of a tougher sell. I mean, forget about eating insects, for I know a lot of people, just looking at them is just weird enough, right? So what I wanted to know was, how could we take this amazing potential that insects have and apply that potential here to improve our lives? Well, one way we could do it is through seafood. And the reason I mention seafood is because I love eating it. In fact, one of my favorite dishes is the salmon my mother makes. Actually, she's in the audience here today, so I'm sure if you tell her you loved hearing my talk, she'll probably give you the recipe. <laughs> so as someone who loves seafood, and as someone who's really curious to know just more about where their food comes from, I started researching the aquaculture industry. And there was one issue that just really grabbed my attention. You see, to feed farm fish, we take wild fish, grind those fish up into a powder called fish meal. We take food that could be used to feed people and instead use it to feed our food. Producing fish meal is the largest contributor to overfishing. And overfishing affects millions of people around the world that rely on the oceans, not just for food, but for their livelihoods. At End Tomorrow, our team researches insects. But more specifically, we research mealworms. And there are three ways in which we can use mealworms to not only address the problem of overfishing, but do so much more. Firstly, mealworms are incredibly nutritious. <coughs> On the x-axis of this graph are the 10 essential amino acids that fish need for healthy growth and development. And these blue bars represent the minimum amounts of those amino acids that are required, in this case for salmon. By replacing fish meal with mealworms, not only, we wouldn't be able to just meet those minimum requirements, we can exceed them. And this produces fish that are healthier. In two studies done last year, researchers were able to show that feeding a mealworm-based diet to catfish and trout, two fish that are farmed, resulted in those fish having stronger immune systems, so they needed fewer antibiotics, and those fish at a higher concentration of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, the good fats that you and I need in our diets. But it gets better. Mealworms use significantly less land to grow. For example, to produce one kilogram of protein using beef, using cows, requires 250 meters squared of land. And to produce the same amount, the same one kilogram using mealworms, requires just 25. And what this means is that at scale, it's cheaper to use mealworms as a source of food as to feed farm fish, which results in lower feeding costs and means that fish actually end up being cheaper for you and I as consumers to purchase. But believe it or not, believe it or not, it gets even better. <laughs> oh yeah, trust me, it does. <laughs> Millworms can eat waste food. Waste food is another huge problem because this food, the food that is thrown away every day by supermarkets and restaurants across the world, doesn't just take up space in our landfills. This food, as it breaks down, contributes three billion metric tons of CO2 into our environment every year. That's 10% of global emissions caused simply by the food that we throw away. Last year, our team at End Tomorrow was able to show that mealworms can eat waste food. In fact, compared to our control diet, the mealworms that were fed on waste food had a nearly identical survival rate.
Oh, sorry, there's just one more thing. Waste food isn't the only thing you find in landfills. You also find a lot of styrofoam. And I'm a mad scientist. So earlier this year, we fed styrofoam to mealworms. <laughs> Turns out, not only can mealworms eat styrofoam, but months later, those same worms were still going at it. Seriously, they can eat styrofoam. How cool is that? <laughs> right? So when we take all of these characteristics, great nutrition, the ability to eat waste food and use less land, they are incredibly powerful. In fact, the animal feed industry, a nearly $400 billion a year industry, is looking to invest in countries, companies that are starting to use insects. So at the end of the day, right, this is all great and exciting, but at the end of the day, what does all of that mean for you? Well, it means that without having to eat a single mealworm, or any insect for that matter, we can still make a difference. It means that by replacing fish meal with mealworms, we can produce fish that are healthier, that taste great, and that are cheaper. It means we can improve our environment by using mealworms to address issues like CO2 and waste food, styrofoam, overfishing. And it means that by using insects, we can create some pretty exciting and new types of economic investment as well. So, I'm a scientist. And one of the reasons I love being a scientist aside from the fact that I get to wear a lab coat, <laughs> is that there are always questions. You answer one question, 10 more pop up. But in this case, there's only one question, at least one question to me that just really, truly mattered. Can we use insects to truly, genuinely change the world? We use a lot of land to grow, raise livestock. And we use even more to grow the food needed to feed those livestock. For example, in Brazil, 33% of agricultural land is used for that purpose. And in order to accomplish this, deforestation on a massive scale needs to occur. Deforestation in Brazil looks like this. And deforestation in Thailand looks like this. Deforestation looks the same wherever you go in the world. And it occurs to produce land. Land that is then used to grow food, not to feed people, but to feed our food, to feed livestock. Now, I don't know about you, but it kind of seems, to me at least, that we already have a solution to this problem, right? I mean, a couple minutes ago, we replaced fish meal with mealworms to feed farm fish. And we know that mealworms are nutritious and that they use less land to grow, so couldn't we just replace soybeans with mealworms and use mealworms to feed livestock? Could we do that? Is it possible? Yes. Hell no. <laughs> that was really fun to say, by the way. <laughs> it's impractical to all of a sudden just change the diet of cows, pigs, other livestock to mealworms all of a sudden. They're not used to it. But we could definitely incorporate mealworms into the existing diet that's definitely more feasible. So if I was to take half the land here, in this area of land, the soybeans that we can grow on this land, we're able to produce 47 million metric tons of soy meal, essentially usable food for livestock. And by replacing those soybeans with mealworms, the first thing we would notice 
is that we can produce the same amount of food. However, because mealworms use significantly less land to grow, simply by changing what our food eats, by feeding livestock, a combination of soybeans and mealworms, this will enable us to free up land, land that can then be reused. And just imagine how this approach, used around the world, could be used to just make things better. Imagine planting trees on that land, trees that would then suck up CO2 and play a crucial role in the fight against climate change. Imagine solar panels on that land that would help us to power millions of homes across Canada and the rest of the world with clean, renewable energy. And in the year 2050, when nine billion people on our planet need to be fed, imagine using this approach, imagine using this land so, so that we could feed every single one of those men, women, and children. <coughs> Climate change, deforestation, waste food, overfishing, poverty, and malnutrition. Insects. It is incredible to think that by using insects, we can start to address every single one of those issues today. That by using insects, we can improve our environment, make our food taste great, create exciting economic opportunities, and even, and even use them as a catalyst for positive social change. <coughs> for those of you that are ready to help me build this uncharted world, the next time you see an insect, don't squish it. Yeah. <laughs> Eat it! Thank you!